everybody. Welcome to another day in the Carney Pop Daily Drop. Today we're going to do a little bit of a vlog and we're going to talk about relatability. Let's talk about relatability. So I've understood this word for a while. I feel like everyone does. It is the trait that a character has to be relatable. But it feels like this trait has been warped over the last few years. Let me start out with something to make sure that, you know, everyone knows that I'm not an alien. I understand the concept of relatability and what it can mean and how it can be good. Now, yeah, where is she? Haruhi. From the melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya. This is a character that was incredibly relatable specifically to me. Her realization of being a small creature in a giant world, despite the fact that she's literally God, which is the irony, of course, um, hit home for me because I had a similar realization when I was very young, similar in age to her, maybe a little younger, where I just realized the limit of my own knowledge of the universe and how there was no way that I could possibly fully know and understand the experiences of every single person. But here is the thing. As I have grown older, I have realized that my view is not as small as I thought it was back then when I was younger. Because we are imaginative beings who have empathy and we have the ability to put ourselves in other shoes. But when I say put ourselves in other shoes, I don't mean take the supreme ego beast that is us as a person and put us wholly into another person's situation and react with all of our baggage attached to it. What we actually have is much subtler and more helpful than that, which is the ability to take the context that we know about somebody, wrap it up, and start to understand why they do the things they do, why they react a certain way, why they act a certain way in certain situations, and then suddenly we find the pieces of them that speak to us, even if they are entirely different. And that's my main problem with this concept of relatability. Because I have seen this term commandeered in recent years to mean that we need more relatable characters to more types of groups. And I want to do an aside here and say that I don't think representation is a bad thing. I think it's great because I think it gives variety. And I think that there is something missing when you do not see any of yourself in the media you consume. It starts to become a conspicuous absence over time. And it's something where I have to recognize my privilege because before I came out uh, as non-binary and pansexual, I identified as a thing that was seen in a lot of media, but realizing exactly how few characters, how few characters represent who I am now in this, in my like more fully realized identity, I do understand that when you finally see one, you go like, oh my God, finally, somebody, somebody who's creating things puts someone like me there and there is a catharsis there it gives points for me but it does not give it is not the end all be all and it does not make a story good good representation doesn't make a story good and the problem is that there's a lot of people when they start talking about this that want representation to be a perfect versions of these people and that's not what any of us want we just want people to be there we want people of different types, different races, sexes, sexual orientations, genders, everything, to just be there and existing in our stories because they're there and they exist in our lives. Now, that's just a, an aside about representation that I wanted to get out of the way while I'm talking about the rest of this. So, this idea about relatability in terms of broadness, which is where I've seen this term used. People want to make these blank slate self-insert protagonists 
Because when you have the ability to project onto something, you have the ability, in theory, to relate to that character more because they'll just be you. The problem with this is that I don't want that. I don't want that and I've never wanted that. I don't generally like self-insert protagonists. I didn't care about customization in Pokemon, really, like customizing your personal character. I care a bit more now. I, I like it as a feature of the game, but my Pokemon adventure was always as the protagonist, and the protagonist always had some traits. They always go on the same adventure. They always meet the same people, and they always react pretty much the same way. Who you choose is different. You have a lot of choices in gameplay. And you do get to go on an adventure. And you even get to name yourself. But that's not what mattered to me. <laughs> the world mattered. The Pokemon mattered. The other characters mattered. And this is something that gets me about self-insert protagonists. And this idea of relatability. In games, you sometimes see a self-insert protagonist used effectively. Like in my favorite game of all time, Undertale by the specificity that the world and other characters have. The situations you go through in Undertale are so specific to the fallen human who has to go through it all. And everyone you meet is so specific, and you even can see them from different angles based on how they react. And that's what I love about the game. What I, I don't care about me in that situation necessarily. I care about the other characters and the effects that my actions have on them. I also... Let me let me explain where I'm coming from and how, how far back this goes for me. I am the kid that left Link his name, that wanted to leave Link his name, that when I named a file in a Legend of Zelda game, I wanted to put L-I-N-K. Because that's who it was. I'm not the hero of time. I'm not Link. Link is Link. Nice little... This is my nice little holographic. I don't know if you can see it there, if it's showing up in the shot at all. This is my nice little holographic golden cartridge of Majora's Mask. This is my favorite Zelda game, tied with Skyward Sword. Please fight me about Skyward Sword if you have a coherent opinion about it. Because most of the people that rag on Skyward Sword have not been able to tell me a single thing that sounds like an actual point. And I really want to have this conversation because I, I, just, I just feel ignorant of the problems people have with the game. That's an aside. But this game, for example, this specific Zelda game, if you think Link is a self-insert protagonist in this game, you're fucking stupid. <laughs> Because Link has gone through a very specific set of circumstances in this game, and that is what makes this game so good. This is Link, where he has met Zelda, all of the events of Ocarina of Time happened and then didn't happen, and then he left because one of his friends is not around. You can debate about whether it's Soraya because of her becoming a sage, or if it's Navi. I'm on the Navi side. I'm also definitely on the side that uh, Link died in the lo getting lost in the Lost Woods and ends up in Termina. But that's a whole other thing, maybe another video, I don't fucking know. But he has very specific traits. He has gone through things at the start of the story. And then by the time you get into the story, when things start happening to him, when you see him the first time he's changed into a Deku and he looks with fear and confusion at his own reflection, and when you see his pain every time he puts on a mask and he has to and he screams those screams terrified me as a kid all of this i'm saying is specifics right these are things that make the the character shine they make the character come out and they make me think oh yeah link went through that and that's really tough I can think about how much it must hurt to not be able to go home, even though that's a condition that I don't have. How much it must hurt to not know where your friend is and to end up in this strange place. How much it must be confusing to be trying to do the right thing in this new land full of creatures, full of people that look like your friends, but they're not. <laughs> 
and so you want to help them, but you're not even sure how much of your life happened, you know? You have a strange sense of a timeline that didn't occur. So that's the type of stuff I'm talking about when I talk about this concept of relatability as broadness not making any fucking sense to me. Because all I see when I see that is a bland character. You can put characters in universal situations and still have such specificity to them. And that is the thing that makes them good. That is the thing that makes people have a reaction to them. I know it's Copilot Coco's thing to talk about Fully Cooly, but I gotta mention it here. Like, look at that. That is a, like, coming-of-age story. As much coming-of-age as it gets, but Nata is a very specific person. He's not every young boy you've ever met. You know? he He's not, like, a later-stage Yu-Gi-Oh! protagonist. Or a light novel adaptation protagonist. Or even some of the worst shonen things. That's what I never liked about Naruto. Is that Naruto is just kind of supposed to be this character that you put stuff on. Because he has some stuff. And by the end of the series, I'm sure, you know, his experiences have built him up. But at the beginning, the core is that he's a lonely kid. And he's got a demon inside of him. And yeah, that's different, I guess. That's different from you. But that's his, like, power source, right? Um, but he just is really energetic and he wants to do the best and he wants to be the best. He's got a lot of bravado and not all the way self-awareness, but he thinks he's really cool, but he isn't always really cool. And he's just a young boy. He's meant to be a, a, a given young boy in that way. But you take that same situation and you morph it you look at something like My Hero Academia, which has learned from its predecessors in Shonen, like, huge, and suddenly, like, Deku. Deku is, like, so much more interesting. He, by the time the series starts, he has, he's got the same outsider idea, right? He's quirkless. Naruto has the demon inside of him. Naruto's inherently grants him power from the beginning. Midoriya's doesn't. That's fine. But the things that Midoriya does are because he has no quirk. He's, like, studious and obsessive over things. And his abilities, his inherent traits that he has built up over time, before we put a camera on him, before we saw the first shot, are what let him do better. They're what let him catch up to everyone else who's been using their quirks all the time, who's been using their quirks since they developed their quirks. So, this has kind of lost a little bit of its focus, but I, I feel like my main, my main point about this is that the idea that a character is more relatable when they are broad is absolute fucking bullshit. And if you are even slightly imaginative as a human being, you are able to put yourself in the shoes of people very, very different from you. And even if you think Gendo is a monster, and I think he's a monster, you can understand what led him to do what he did in Evangelion. You can take the steps to understand who he is. And just because you wouldn't make those same decisions doesn't mean that he didn't end up making those decisions the way he does. And doesn't mean that there can't be something in his story that speaks to you. Even if you don't have a dead wife. And don't live in a world attacked by angels. Like, you don't need those traits to pick up on his traits and find the relatable parts of his story. Let's let, let's close this on an on, a, on what I think might be an unexpected one. Maybe not. Pikmin. It's kind of shiny there. Pikmin two. This could be any Pikmin game. Well, I haven't finished three, so one or two. But 
Pikmin. Pikmin 2 is a good example, specifically because it has the Piclopedia. There is so much characterization in this game. Because you play as Olimar and Louis the whole time. Louis is the most underdeveloped character, by far. But Olimar is a very, again, specific character. Even though he, if you don't read anything, he's just the spaceman who crashed and crash landed and is putting his ship back together in the first one, let's say. In the first one, whenever he encounters a ship piece, he it types out his log about it. And in this one, he writes the Piclopedia because he's a scientist at heart. Even though Olimar is a trucker, he is an interstellar truck driver. It's Hawkatate Freight that moves Pick Pick brand carrots across the galaxy. This, the idea of this character, who has a wife and kids, loves both of his kids, specifically thinks about them when he gets certain ship pieces or sees certain creatures, and it's very specific, it's very certain ones. But also as someone who is this amateur scientist who revels at the idea that, holy crap, I found a new planet. I get to explore all of this. Yeah, I'm going to fucking die from oxygen poisoning if I don't figure this out. But he doesn't have to keep a captain's log. He doesn't have to write the Piclopedia. He decides to. And that's fucking cool. That's something I've always loved about Omar. And I don't know if I'd be the same way. But I don't care. What I care about is the idea of this truck driver who's a scientist at heart and gets an opportunity to do it. So, my apologies to anyone who might find this a little 101, because I, I imagine if you already agreed with me, then this video seems like me talking in circles, and it probably is a bit of me talking in circles. I'm trying to get a little bit better at unstructured vlog things, because I'm trying to get better at everything. And we'll see if I do. But I think that is all I have on the concept of relatability as it is currently being used. And who knows, maybe down the line I'll clean up these thoughts and try and give it in a little more succinct package. Probably not, but who knows. So that's it for me, and this is Carney Pop signing off. Bye.